Ready. Hello, I'm Jill Zimaborski in the Florida Keys. I'm a 27 year journalist down here and I'm with today, Dr. Jerry Lawrence, State Director of Research at the Audubon Florida Everglades Science Center in Isla Mirada in the Florida Keys. So we have Dr. Lawrence with us today and he's going to share with us some research that he's been doing oh the last decade or a couple of decades. So Jerry, <laughs> so, so Jerry, tell us what you've been up to. Well, hi Jill. Um, thanks for having me. Um, so I've been studying basically Everglades ecology in Florida Bay um, since 1989. In about, about 2005, the, you know, I study roseate spoonbills, which is a wading bird. Those birds started to do things that were really unexpected, and I could not understand why. And it took me about, <clears throat> about um, seven, eight years to come to realize that they're responding to increased water levels um, on the areas where they forage. They need low water level you know, their legs are only so long, their bills are only so long, and, you know, they feed by feel. They, they feed by what we call tactile location. So they have to have these really low water and really concentrated fish to be able to raise their young here in Florida Bay. And About how many inches are, are we thinking? Is it, is it well, six? Uh, is it... I can show you that, but this is what me got me thinking is, is, you know, on this is just the water levels measured at Key West. Okay. Key West Harbor, which is, you know, not, roughly 90 miles southwest of here. Yeah. So it's yeah. essentially out in the Gulf in the, in the Atlantic. And it, we really started seeing some changes in early in 2000. Um, and and this, this record goes back to 1913. Okay. So this is a very long-term record. And what I've graphed here is just the annual sea level um, that they measure there, the, the, what the annual mean sea level in reference to mean low, low water, which means two tides a day, the lowest one is the low, low water. <clears throat> and we see that the, um, you know, over the last 20 years, it's gone up exponentially. So these, this is in centimeters. And basically what we have is 15 centimeters in 2000, 2020 above what it was historically. Well, 15 centimeters is uh, roughly six inches. Okay. So that's a lot of water for a bird whose bill is only nine inches long. Um, now, one of the places that these birds feed is where we collect our information. We collect salinity and water level and water temperature, as well as the things that the birds are feeding on, the fish. And all I've done here is graph the, again, the annual mean water level. And, you know, this goes from 1990 to 2021. And you can see it, it, it for almost two decades, it just bounced around, um, didn't. But then in about 2008, nine, especially after 2010, 11, it skyrockets. Yeah. And that's an that exponential increase. Now the dash lines here are the decadal mean. So you take all of these for this decade and you calculate the mean. And you can see that, you know, it's just above 15, which is, it's just relatively water, what get relative water depth. So that's how deep the water is if you're standing there. Yeah. Well, about 16 centimeters, about, you know, 16 centimeters again for the second decade. And then it goes up to about 23 centimeters. Mm -hmm. every and it's very rapid. And if you compare this data to the Key West data, it's almost perfectly linear. Um, you know, it, it, there, there is very little deviation from that increase. If Key West is high, so is the water level 120 miles to the Northeast. Exactly, and that is the, the length of the keys roughly. So we can yeah. see over this great distance of 120 miles, um, the, the sea level is telling us there's been a rise. Yep, and we work at uh, 12 of these locations and they all show the same pattern. 
fast. Um, so it is, it's not something to do with the Everglades. It's not something to do with, you know, water coming up from upstream. Yeah. This is correlated directly with the ocean. Yeah. The Gulf of Mexico. Yeah. So it is an entirely, you know, kind of a one-to-one -one relationship. <clears throat> if it goes up an inch in Key West, it goes up an inch in these wetlands where these birds feed. Um, now, at this PCT, that's just the prey concentration threshold. This comes from our collecting 30 years of, of you know, the, the food data out there. And we found that, um, th that the fish start to become highly concentrated one that relative water depth gets to be about 13 centimeters. Mm. So that's when the fish leave this great big wetland and go into these holes and creeks where they become highly concentrated and available to the birds. Um, so if, if you look at how many days, this is the lower graph here, how many days that were below the prey concentration threshold in 2004 and five, this is just three, again, three of our sites. Mm -hmm. you know, it was 100 to even above 200 days. And there is this straight line going down. And in 2018, 19, 2019, 20, we're down to less than 50 days a year, in some cases, less than 25. Mm. Takes about three months for, for spoonbills to raise their young. And so we don't have fish concentrated for that long anymore. And therefore, the young die in the nest. There's just not enough food. They're starving. Uh, They're starving. Yep. yep, exactly. And so this is, <clears throat> this is really kind of a scary thing. Um, <clears throat> I'm going to skip around here a little bit. Sure. And, and everyone knows what a roseate spoonbill looks like, I believe. It's these beautiful kind of corally <laughs> pink birds, not the same as a flamingo, but just there we've got a photo. <laughs> with so that's the what a spoonbill looks bill. like. Yeah, with the spoonbill, literally. With the bill, and that when it touches a fish, that automatically snaps shut and they eat it and or take it back to the nest. Um, so, you know, what we have found with our studies is that this is the number of spoonbill nests in Florida Bay. That's the black line. Okay. You can see that at about 1979, it peaked at about 1,250 nests. Okay. And by the way, before 1935, there weren't any spoonbills nesting in Florida Bay because around the turn of the century, they were totally hunted to extirpation in Florida. So and, it took and, and people may not know again that their beautiful feathers were being used in women's hats and for various other beautification purposes. And again, you know, we, we took advantage of these, this beautiful bird and uh, wiped them out. Wiped them out, um, just hunted them. You know, it, they were worth more than their weight in gold by a good margin. Mm. Um, the feathers. Mm. But then in 1981, we changed how the flow from the Everglades, freshwater flow, entered Florida Bay. And shortly thereafter, Florida Bay went through a, a total ecological collapse, um, you know, with, within, the, within about six years. And what we see is, is the real kind of weird decline and then bounce back and then another decline mm. in the number of spoonbills. And this is beyond our conversation here, why it went up and then back down. But sure, you can see yeah. it just continues to go down and down and down after the year 2000. Um, and even though Everglades restoration improved the flow, we start seeing really dramatic changes after the 2010, 2011 nesting season. And we see almost a complete collapse. This ends in 2020, the, the nesting year 2020-21. Okay. This year we're actively collecting that data, and it is this. You can see it's still 200 nests total. Yep. This year it'll be less than 100 because oh. the water level is so high. Oh boy. And, and and we don't have again the data to add, you know, the next column on that Key West graph. Yeah. Because the hydrologic year, which runs from June to May, isn't done yet. Okay. So I can't calculate that. Sure. But I anticipate this year will be another 
pretty broad jump upward. Um, and the funny thing is, is that birds throughout the Everglades are not nesting this year because mm. we're putting all this water into the system through Everglades restoration and it can't get out. So all of these birds require this concentration of fish and it's just not happening because there is, is too much water. We, we fixed, well, we haven't fixed it, but we've made the Everglades better. It gets more fresh water than it has in the last 30 years, but there's no place for that water to go uh. because the ocean levels are so high when that water tries to flow out. And so even though last year we had the second highest number of nests in the Everglades since the 1940s, this year we're likely to have one of the lowest. And why is that, do you think? Why was it so good? And then, you know, uh, what was that linked to? Well, I think it has to do with, like I said, the, the combination of we're putting more water in the system, which is a good thing, and yep. no water can't get out. Yeah. Whereas last year, the water was still high, but not as high as it was this year. So the yep. water could get out. Yep. And so you had a much better Everglades. And the water wasn't as high as it is this year, so it could flow outward, lowering the water levels and concentrating those fish. Oh, and, dear. You know, this is just this is just the things that 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 we see. And you know, um, the other thing that that I'm going to point out is is with this comes even though we have lower salinity this, this year, lower salt content in the water mm -hmm. because we fixed the flowway. Yeah. Eventually, the sea level rise is going to push in salt water into that environment, mm -hmm. right? Yes. And what this graph shows is that when you have a freshwater environment, which is what we're trying to get, you have a lot more fish. The yeah. fish is way high. And as soon as you start adding any salt at all, it drops way down. So this is the number of fish. This is the weight of the fish. And it's very clear that these fish do much better when we have freshwater conditions. Mm. So you're raising sea level, you're going to raise salinity. Eventually, you're going to have fewer fish, and then they can't go through this process where you, they make a lot more of themselves during the wet season. Then during the dry season, the water level starts to go down. And as I said, at 13 centimeters, they get concentrated. That's right. And they get even more concentrated. And this is what the birds are taking advantage of. Those are great graphics. Definitely. So, you know, this is a situation that we're dealing with. And, yeah. you know, we work at. Um, uh, so these are all the locations we work. OK. And how many of roughly are there? Well, there's three on Cape Sable and then there's 13, I think, 14. Okay. Uh, from Seven Palm Lake around to Turkey Point. Okay. The red dots are the places where we actually sample fish. The sure. white ones are just where we have uh, water measurements. So it's true of all these places. Yeah. So it, this is not just a localized thing. It is, you know, it really does show the, the big difference. And this is an aerial photograph of one of our sites. Oh. And all I'm doing here is showing here is this central creek and these extensive areas you see to either side, those are where the fish spread out during the summer, feed, make a whole lot more of themselves. And then in the winter, all of this habitat used to dry out uh. and the fish would come concentrated here. What these are is these are sampling nets for fish. Sure, sure. And when I started, when I started this program, when I designed this system for collecting fish in 1989, these areas out here, we would have to put boardwalks out to. <laughs> so you'd literally have to pick up a boardwalk, throw it down so that you could collect the sample. We don't have to do that anymore. Oh, we go wow. out there in a kayak oh. because it never dries out. Mm, interesting. So the fish are not becoming concentrated. And just, oh, by the way, just the, this is one of my net frames. It doesn't Beautiful. have a net on it, but it just shows that this, we're, we're sampling exactly where the spoonbills feet, right? So yep. that's, a real, right that's a real flock right there, huh? Yeah. We go to 
what, we set these sites up because this is where those birds feed. Mm -hmm. um, and then just to show you a couple of other things is this was data collected in 1990-91. And my predecessors who, who hired me to study the fish, mm -hmm. they were studying the spoonbills at the time. I've since taken over both programs. But they attached radio transmitters to birds that were nesting in Florida Bay. And you can see this is where they're foraging. These are all the hits that they got from two different nesting colonies in two different years. So you can see they're nesting all this area up here in northeastern Florida Bay. Hmm. I repeated that study using satellite transmitters in 2006 through 2009. This is just one example of one bird. It's still using this habitat that we documented in the 1990-91, still using it pretty heavily, but now it's going for, further to the west. Okay. 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 So that was in 2006. This is in 2000, this was just last year. So this is 2021. Yeah. This bird is nesting right there. And you can see that it's hardly using this habitat up here. It's, mm -hmm. nesting. it's using this habitat out here in the bay. So they're having a harder time finding places to forage. And this is just a comparison of my 2006 to nine data to my 2021 data. And by the way, this is our third year. Yeah. So we have more data than this now. Okay. But look how heavily they were for, they were in here in 2006 to 2009. They're hardly going in there at all. Oh boy. They have totally you moved. Look huh? down here out, out in the Bay Keys where we have a wetland that is a little bit higher elevation. It's just not as productive as this habitat up here. Yeah. And yeah. Look how little it got used in 2006. Look how heavily it got used in 2021. So th these birds are entirely changing where they forage. And it's because they're desperate. They're just trying to find any food and having to go further and, and in different directions yeah. to find it. Yeah, you know, we know they want to nest out there. We see birds that we banded in the in 2000, you know, 2003 and four. Hmm. They're trying to nest. Yeah. It's just there's no habitat left. There's no place. They want to nest in Florida Bay. That's where they were hatched but there's, they don't have the ability. Is it kind um, of like sea turtles that they try and go back to the yeah. same places that, yeah, that they grew up? Pretty much. Hmm. And this is just the, just throwing something else in the mix. And this is hypothetical, okay. but our data kind of show it is, so out where these spoonbills feed, we have this introduced fish called a Mayan cichlid. Yes. It's an exotic invasive. Yep. So it can take over. And this fish defends its young, is highly territorial, is omnivorous, so it'll eat the fish, other fish, mm. and it'll outcompete other fish because it's uh -oh. so aggressive. So if you look at, at, this is just our database of fish density versus a fish biomass. Okay. You can see the average for each year tracks pretty close. Yep. So... There's pretty much, if you add one fish, you add this, this many grams over. So that's all these little fish that yeah. these birds and spoonbills prey on. Right after two, th you, you see that, you know, in some years, you got a higher density than biomass, mm -hmm. right? In that magic year, 2010-11, it switched. Okay. So now, instead of having high density lots of fish we have very few fish but they're really big oh and so probably too big for the spoonbills huh well they're not only that they eat everything that the spoonbills and the other birds eat exactly so this fish it breeds once a year at our in our habitats okay um and then they the, the two parents protect their brood yeah so they can have a, a thousand eggs Oh my. And all hatch. And so they protect their brood. Yeah. And they do that for a month or two. And so those fish have a great advantage over all the other fish. Yeah. Yep. By the end of the first year, by the time it rolls around to when it starts to get dry again in November and December, those fish are only, you know, centimeter or two. Okay. The, the babies. 
So at that point in time, all these birds was, were coming in and feeding on. Okay. So knocking them out of the system, taking them out. Sure. Okay. If you don't take them out of the system, they get to be six or seven inches long. Yeah. Yeah. So now our, 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 our fish community, it was always kind of dominated by these fish. Yeah. It wasn't the number one species, but it was always way up there. Yeah. But they were little. Now, all we collect are these great big cichlids. cichlids. Those, those fish are eating the other fish. They're too big for our birds to feed on. Um, and they're, they're basically a monoculture now of these large <laughs> because the marsh doesn't dry out. Now, everything I've said there, I have yet to statistically analyze and publish. Sure, sure. That is our next step is we want to test this hypothesis. Jerry, our- you're de- it sounds like there are so many factors against our roseate spoonbills. Like, what do we think could be a solution? No, the spoonbills will make their own solution. They're doing really well elsewhere. Good, good. Um, good. They... They're also responding to global climate change in that they've expanded their range historically, even going back to the 1800s. They never nested north of Tampa Bay on yep. the Gulf Coast and, you know, Cape Canaveral, Merritt Island, yep. on the East Coast. Over the last 10 to 15 years, I've gotten reports from my colleagues, and this is all published of them moving up the state and not only moving up the state, but moving inland. So they they were always coastal nesters. Now they're nesting in, you know, Lake Okeechobee in the middle of the Everglades. They've started moving up the state and inland. Um, So, you know, for example, like in 2005 or six, they started nesting, you know, kind of north of Lake Okeechobee. And then another, uh, another colony popped up further north. And then, one popped up in Cedar Keys, one popped up at um, St. Augustine Alligator Farm in St. Augustine. Next thing you know, we got spoonbills nesting in Southern Georgia. Oh my. All the way into in Southern South Carolina last year. Wow. Um, and in Arkansas last year. Oh, so yeah. they're digging this climate change thing. Yeah. It's yeah. expanding their range. And they're smart enough, unlike the stupid humans that, that we are, that they don't need the keys, right? Yeah. They, they're like, uh, you know, I don't need this. I'm going to go someplace else. That's it. So that they have now, we have more spoonbills in the state of Florida. And, and this is just, this is just me estimating. So nobody does these surveys statewide. Okay. But I would say statewide, we have more spoonbills nesting in Florida now than we have had since before they were hunted to extinction. Wow. You wow. Know, I, my best guess is we got between five and 10,000 nesting spoonbill pairs in Florida, if not more. And they're just I not think, concentrated. They're just not down here. Well, no, they're, they're just moving inland. You know, yeah. the nests are really concentrated. They're just, Florida Bay doesn't work. Yeah. So the spoonbills are fine. They're smart. Well, they, good. Know, that's they, that's encouraging, huh? Yeah, they um, you know, they, and I have other data that shows this is that they first moved further and further north in the bay, and then they moved onto the mainland. And oh, here's a whole nother speculation of mine <laughs> is that they never wanted to nest on the mainland because yeah. the access of raccoons to the colony and oh. a raccoon will just destroy. A nest. They'll go yeah. in and eat the chicks, eat the eggs, tear out the nest. And so they always wanted to be on these islands that were relatively free of raccoons. Um, well, the pythons ate all the raccoons. Oh. Uh, so, and that is not a silver lining. Yeah. Yeah. It means that now the spoonbills who don't know anything about Burmese pythons are nesting on the mainland because there aren't any raccoons. However, there are Burmese pythons. Yes. Yes. So, and what know. about, so are they getting more comfortable in freshwater? I mean, I'm thinking about yeah. Lake Okeechobee, et cetera, right? So by default, they're finding fish in freshwater sources or perhaps brackish or something. Um, 
yeah, what's the future of that? Are they they going to become a freshwater? Oh, they, they, in in many parts of the in, of their range, they are freshwater animals. Uh -huh. um, I mean, you know, they nest. There's a large nesting colonies in um, the Pantanal, which is an in, inland freshwater, and they're you know, so they've Canada? always been able to adapt to freshwater. They just didn't here in Florida. Okay, that's fascinating. So, Jill, I am late for my meeting. I exactly. Just got I got to let you go. But this has been fascinating. And we will stay in touch. And thank you so much. Your presentation on how sea level rise has affected our beautiful Rosier Spoonbills is very disturbing. And uh, we'll, we'll look forward to more of your published research results. Uh, hopefully, I'll get some of them out here okay. shortly. But... <laughs> We need um, we need about four of you, four of you, and yeah, then you can get, I need get about done, four. Right? Yep, and that's what I need. So, um, well, thank Jill, you. It's so been a pleasure much. talking to you. Yes, thank you, Dr. Jerry Lawrence with the Audubon Everglades Science Center. We appreciate you. Bye. Thanks. We'll talk soon.